Thanks, Paul Flew, for the introduction. So my name is Dr Jennifer Lee. I am currently a lecturer at Northumbria University based in Amsterdam, um, and I'm currently chair of the Human Data Interaction Committee for um, the EC3 uh, Council. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is the paper that we presented, we, we researched and um, presented a paper as part of that committee um, on human data interaction blockchain. Um, and I gave a shorter version of this presentation um, in Crete a few weeks ago. And the reason why I'm going to present a more detailed version today is because I want us um, later on in the focus group session to, to take forward some of these uh, to start kind of uncovering and unpicking some of the challenges that we have uncovered in this paper. Um, so what I will do today is first, there will be kind of a, short, a relatively short presentation on um, human data interaction, what it is, um, what the implications are and considerations for blockchain that we uncovered in our first paper um, and what some of the open challenges are that we identified. And then we'll move on to kind of a bit of a breakout session. So I'm not sure how many people you have there in the room in terms of how many people would be per session, but we can figure that out later. And then we'll come back together and have a bit more of a discussion session. So I think in terms of the schedule, um, there's a bit more flexibility. So I don't think it will um, kind of run over, which hopefully will be fine and keep everybody on track for tea and coffee um, later on. Um, but before we do kind of go into the breakout sessions, there will be time for questions, um, just a clarification on anything that I've presented. So the team, that has been working on this project to date. Um, you can see here we are, most of us are from the um, EC3 Human Data Interaction Committee, but some of us um, joined just in terms of expertise. So you can see Prof um, Barati there, who was at Newcastle University and his expertise was on blockchain and GDPR. So he came and joined the, um, the, the team, but wasn't is not part of our committee. Um, and also Jens, who I think is in the room with you there, he was also part of the, the team, um, but not part of the committee. And I think it just shows, you know, we have people from across Europe and now um, obviously in Canada as well that brought some kind of expertise to this work that we were trying to look at and really start to explore what the potential is or the issues are around human data interaction for blockchain infrastructure. Um, so the project itself had two objectives. And the first was to explore the current level of understanding of human data interaction for blockchain infrastructure. The second was to empirically generate potential future challenges from research, uh, for research um, within this field. And so the idea is that we started the discussion and, and wanted to kind of push that information out there for people um, to start building on this, this work going forward. Um, so our initial paper, which was a conference paper, um, consisted of a short literature review, of which there's not much literature. Um, at the moment, uh, followed by a focus group with people um, who have been researching blockchain in construction for about five or six weeks. And this resulted in a conference paper at the EC3 conference in July. So um, looking at human data interaction, we are in this time where we have a huge, um, huge advancements in technology. Um, we need to focus on how interactions are changing between systems as technological systems and humans as a result of that. Data are uh, offered by both freely. So things that we put out into the world, um, maybe we kind of post on social media or LinkedIn, or we put information out there by our or our use that we um, have for our online presence, things we do um, day to day in work, what have you. And then there's data that are collected about us. So, so what we offer freely, and then the things that are collected about us about behaviors, about things that we do when we're online. So the data are generated either by human interaction or they're used for in human interaction um, at a point in the future. And this is based on um, data uh, that we can use to make decisions. So the term human data interaction or the concept stems from human computer interaction, where this is about the interactions between humans and computers as artifacts. But this is going a bit more um, specifically to the data element rather than the computers. Uh, we have still an issue of informed consent when it comes to data and use of data by um, companies, organizations, institutions, and so on. Um, and so what's really important here is how we understand the interaction between humans and data. In this world of ubiquitous, ubiquitous computing, um, we need to now focus on how individuals interact with the data 
of systems rather than the actual systems themselves. And we have this um, kind of finding here from a paper from Victorelli is that the HDI is about manipulation and comprehension of big data sets with a focus on personal data and the implications regarding decision making and action taking. We have um, a number of definitions that have been published previously. Um, so just to kind of give you a bit more of an understanding of what these mean from other authors and other researchers, HDI is about federating disparate personal data sources and en enabling use and control over the use of data. It's about human manipulation, analysis, sense-making of large, unstructured and complex data sets. It's about processes of collaboration with data and the development of human communication tools that enable interactions. It's about delivering personalized, context-aware and understandable data from big data sets. And it's about providing access and understandings of data that is about individuals and how it affects them. From the white paper from the Human Data Interaction Committee that should be published at some point later on this year, I believe, um, Human Data Interaction is focused on digital data, large amounts of personal data, interaction topics, and enabling access control and collaboration. And finally, it should consider the system of beliefs, values, and norms of the people involved, and not only people who direct access and who directly access and use data, but also those who affect and are affected by the results of their usage. And the point around all of these different definitions is it's quite easy to see. It's really about the human at the center. So it's about what we do with this data, how we collect this data that really impacts on humans um, and us kind of individuals data in general public. We have this um, this three pillars that were identified identified both by Mortier. Uh, Mortier and his team are one of the uh, really prominent researchers for human data interaction, and they raised three pillars of legibility, agency, and negotiability. Um, and more importantly, that we currently lack legibility, agency, and negotiability as humans. So, so this is focusing on um, the ability to understand data and processing as well as ensure, ensure the transparency. Agency is our ability to be able to opt in or out of data systems, as well as control and amend one's data. And negotiability focuses on relationships between data and their processing, which includes, of course, the regulatory environment, the societal norms, and the individuals changing attitudes towards personal data. So we have this kind of feedback loop where we have data that we generate, um, it's collected and analytics are performed on it. We make inferences from that, and then we make decisions that actually perform actions on that. And this is where these three elements come in that we as humans should have the ability to do these things. Currently, we, we lack the ability because of the way systems are developed and set up and controlled by central parties. So literature um, on human data interaction and construction starts with um, a paper by Calvetti who is one of our, who's actually our vice chair for the Human Data Interaction Committee. His paper was on uh, censored construction sites. Um, so sensing should concentrate on workforce performance monitoring to understand data process and stakeholder interaction. The vision of HDI implies evaluation of the uh, collected data implications in the construction industry, glimpsing par uh, paradigms and regulations. And use cases and frameworks consider data interactions regarding workforce performance and delivering analysis to GDPR compliance. Their further paper um, focused on digital twin, which was published this year, and kind of made the finding that digital twin will result in substantial uh, increase in volume of stakeholder data from both virtual and physical assets. If we investigate human data interaction and the digital twin, we'll improve awareness and compliance on data acquisition and use. Um, and they defined a number of levels of DT, um, kind of HDI and DT increments that focus on requirements, linkages, HDI is proposed, HDI connected, training, learning, and independence, and so on. Bushra uh, is the only paper that we have come across um, previous to the paper I'm now presenting um, that was focusing on blockchain. Um, their paper focused on operational risk management and stated that blockchain is potentially capable of leveraging big data for the capabilities of humans by offering a sort of source for trusted data. It can potentially shift human data interaction to the end user's benefit, but to achieve this is also introduces new properties um, that may need the development of new skills. 
So there's some kind of, again, kind of bringing some open challenges in there, things that we need to explore as a research community. Um, and then focusing also on digital twin, Agravel, the interaction between humans and digital twins. And while they do not specifically to data in the exchange, it does consider the different roles and responsibilities that humans have for digital twins. So what we have is that between them sits data that facilitates the exchange and uh, integration to serve the construction industry. So let's move on to some of the challenges that came out of the literature before we focused on uh, identifying in our own focus group. So how do we make individuals aware? How do they access and how can we change and or improve data? Um, users should be involved in the design process and co-creation of data consumption environments. It puts the emphasis on us as humans and how we have control over that. Um, we should address policies and ethics of data ownership. And we need to create effective visualizations of data to support decision making. Economic value um, is currently obtained by actors that exploit data that are collected about us as individuals rather than us as data owners or data producers to actually uh, gain economic value from that. And this results in a misalignment of power around data ownership. There should be a conceptualization of pragmatic, pragmatic and social issues, considering the social impact data and HDI should enable stakeholders to promote more desired and, uh, and avoid undesired consequences of data use. Uh, Calvetti also focused on the issue around data ownership, which seems to be a theme here, separation between data analysis of the task or the individual, um, looking at GDPR and informed consent of individuals and data protection and uh, data collection, and then how we as individuals trust HDI systems with regards to possible misuse of data. So a lot of this seems to be coming up around um, the misuse and ethical issues around data and how that's collected and used against us rather than for us. And just to give a bit of a kind of conceptualization here, we have this graphic um, that Kind of has a worker for 4.0, so it's a highly censored, censored construction site with lots of different data points that can be collected on individuals who are working on site. Um, physiological kind of issues, but then there's also the things that they do, so human factors and the performance. And so we have all of this data from a construction site specifically, but then of course from um, data we have data that's collected and produced and collected throughout the the whole life cycle of the project project from design through operation and maintenance and of course, end of life. Um, and then that generates, we have this kind of idea of the golden thread of information. So all of this data is collected across the life cycle and a lot of that data will relate to humans, particularly when, when we get into kind of um, operational use of buildings and assets that looks at how um, we as users or occupants of buildings behave, and what's our experience and how can we use the data to benefit rather than exploit individuals um, and so on. And of course, the, 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 we could add a number of different um, data points and uh, uses for, for human data within the built environment, just to fit, give a bit of a kind of conceptualization. Um, so the outcomes of the project we will look at now. Um, the first thing that we did was agree to the current working definition from the HDI white paper. And this was to understand the interactions between actors and data across the planning, design, production, operation, and use of built, built assets in order to improve the outcomes and value of data to the involved and affected actors. And you can see here the outcomes of the focus group that we ran, where that we identified a number of considerations for blockchain and HDI. And we categorized this through thematic analysis of the transcript from the workshop uh, focus group into both technical factors and non-technical factors, and then those factors that kind of overlap. And I'll run through each of these now. So we can see here from a technical uh, perspective, I think we have, I think it's been discussed today you know, about immutability of blockchain and how that's one of the most central um, elements of um, applications for the built environment, um, but it also allows exploitation um, of human data by corporations. Data storage is an issue and there's potential issues around compatibility um, with the GDPR, for example, the right of erasure. So if data is there forever, how can it be removed? But if there is a right of erasure, how do we comply with that? Um, we have 
this idea that, that the data, we don't store data generally on chain, we store proof of the data on chain, um, and we point to the data off chain, um, but what happens if the data off chain are deleted? So we have issues around that. Some of these issues I think we'll talk about um, with Cla uh, Claudia today with her research on blockchain based CVEs. Um, so perhaps this will come into kind of discussions during the focus group part of today. And we have transparency issues. Um, what about when we have um, data retention regulations where data have to be held for a minimum of say seven years and they can be deleted, but if they're immutable on a blockchain, they can't be deleted. Do we have informed consent around that? And do they come into contractual obligations? Is it something that we have to comply with? And in which case, you know, how do we actually kind of deal with all of the issues if we've got immutability, um, but we need to be able to have to you know, delete that data at some point, or can we ensure that we've got informed consent and so on? From a system design perspective, um, what happens if we design it badly? We're all human, we all make mistakes. Um, and what happens if the code is wrong and we have data that ends up on a public blockchain by mistake that is immutable? Um, how come so that can't be removed? Um, so we've got to think about how we um, test systems to make sure that they get the, um, that they are kind of right first time. So. And then we have the idea of integrating technologies. And one of the issues we discussed during the focus group was this perpetuation of systemic biases. And while data, uh, while blockchain is not a kind of a data collection or production type technology, of course, it does use data sets. So what about if we have data sets that we use in AI or ML, for example, that perpetuate systemic biases? If so, do we have to, do we need to fix data sets before we feed them into blockchain so that we don't perpetuate these issues um, that currently exist within society? From a non-technical perspective, we, this, this kind of leads on to ethics, which links to what we just talked about, what, what I just mentioned before, and systemic biases. Um, but there's also exploitation of data. So can we use systems like blockchain and smart contracts to design out the ethical issues? How can we incentivize differently? So how do we use economic models um, through blockchain and smart contracts and different kind of, so are there different, different governance structures, different ways of doing things and kind of start pushing people to start working in different ways than we're currently used to in construction? We have environmental issues. Um, so we produce more and more data. So how do we store that? Um, does that have issues around energy consumption? And of course, energy consumption relates really more to proof of work when it comes to blockchain. But it's something that we need to consider given that blockchain um, is one of the most kind of well 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 known and well used types of, of, of distributed ledger but there are, there are obviously more energy efficient systems but it's about how we kind of build in these systems and make sure we can use blockchain um to facilitate things like sustainable practices so whether it's a circular economy carbon credit trading increased transparency and so on um from a political perspective we have issues around use of cryptocurrencies they can be very beneficial but they're kind of mostly unregulated and the compliance with um, regulations. We can use it to prevent fraud, but also there are you know, different issues of how we, about how we actually do that. Um, can we use it to navigate institutional corruption and mismanagement, for example? Um, or we do, is this another way for people to actually find ways to, to continue doing this using these technologies? Um, and then there are opportunities from a social perspective um, around using these technologies to promote ownership um, or improve issues about ownership, inclusion, transparency, and accountability. So a few overlapping factors that didn't kind of fit into just technical or just non-technical. Um, here we have issues around governance. And one thing that came out from the discussions at the first group, focus group was that blockchain is quite often discussed as a tool for governance, but we miss out in, in research how we actually govern the blockchain generally. So this is something that we want to consider um, as a committee, as a, as a project. Um, and then what are the things that we should automate? Just because we can automate things doesn't mean that we should automate things, everything. Sometimes things can actually just remain with the human and should remain with the human. So it's about looking at what the kind of cuts off or what the, the requirements are for those issues. And we can bring in things like decentralized autonomous organizations to provide a solution to those issues.
Um, from a data type or um, data usage perspective, um, are we talking about individual data or do we talk about individual data that make up big data? So different data points that relate to specific individuals that are used on a broad scale or is it around the you know, specific data that relates to me, Jennifer Lee? These are, um, you know, it's not necessarily one or the other, but these are the different things that we consider when we look at human data interaction. And then we have the issue of the data longevity. Will it be there in 50 years time if we need it? Um, does it, should it be there in 50 years time? And if not, how do we remove it? Um, what is the sustainability issue around storage and management of data? And do we have issues around interoperability? So maybe it works on systems now, but maybe it doesn't use time. So we have to think about these things about how we manage that going forward. Um, data privacy, compliance with things like GDPR, how do we access data, how do we delete it, and so on. And then we also have this idea of control of data. So in theory, blockchain um, will increase control of data through increased visibility. Um, we have this new, not quite so new now, um, idea of Web3 that kind of changes the way we own data. So this is the new kind of own part of the read write own paradigm. Um, but this a lot of these things require change, um, a lot of change in a very change resistant industry. So how do we actually manage that as a process? So some of the um, open challenges that we pulled out from the focus group, um, of which there are six, are here. So we have um, the first question is, does blockchain increase the level of human data interaction and construction? How does blockchain interact with human data interaction along the intersection of the factors mentioned above? So that's from the technical, non technical and overlapping factors. What data types and the associated human data interactions are suitable for blockchain in the built environment? Because we don't necessarily need to use it for everything. And it comes back to the question, you know, do you need a blockchain? Um, maybe we don't. Um, when we say human data interaction and construction, do we refer to individuals or larger social groups? And what are the implications of that, one or the other or both? Are we looking at how human data interaction could support the implementation of blockchain and construction or at human data interaction emanating from the use of blockchain and construction? And then how do we rethink data ownership with Web3? So um, for the part where we will actually break out into groups, I will provide you with a link to a mirror board and that will have also a link to these slides. So I'm not gonna go through this and I think most of you in the room will probably understand a bit about Web3, um, but if you wanna have a look at a very, very simple idea of Web3, this slide here will give you that information. Um, but that brings my kind of presentation so close. So now we'll open up to questions before we move on if anybody wants any clarification or they have anything they wanna ask before we I brief the next part of the session. So thank you, uh, 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 Dr. Lee, for the presentation. Questions from the floor, any questions? Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, Abel. Hi, Jennifer. Yeah, I have lots of questions, as usual. Um, <laughs> so first question I have here, is it time to then review GDPR and GDPR language and uh, how we're using it? Or do you think there is more work that needs to be done before we get to that point, GDPR 2.0? Well, I mean, from, a, from, a, from my own perspective, I think we probably do need to rethink GDPR generally rather than um, necessarily specifically blockchain. And I think that will come in time, mainly on the basis that um, things that we do, you know, GDPR is probably kind of the first iteration of data protection and giving ownership back to individuals. And so I think there will be more to do on that. Um, I think from a when we consider it from a blockchain perspective, we probably need to focus on what we have at the moment because we also know how um, long these things take to change. So if we waited for GDPR, GDPR2 to come out, then we might be waiting for another 10 years and that we, you know, would take too long. So I think it's probably something that we need to do as a research community is think about how GDPR works at the moment, try and solve some of the issues around GDPR and the implications of that for blockchain um, if we can and almost drive that change um, and look at how we leverage blockchain as part of that solution. Right, yeah, okay. So now I'll give a moment. I have other three questions, but I'll give a moment to people. Any questions? It's 
working. It's on? Yeah. So, hi, Jennifer. Uh, I have just one question. Uh, in terms of governance, you've mentioned that what can be automated and uh, what should not be automated or stay with humans. So, uh, could you just uh, like elaborate on that? Because, uh, I mean, how to decide uh, like uh, what works and what does not work, whether it becomes subjective or uh, can we make it more, uh, you know, objective? Yeah, I, I think, uh, thanks for your question. I think it's it's probably something that would be done case by case um, from an application perspective um, as to the different elements that should be. So, so I think, you know, we probably read a lot and talk a lot about um, automation through smart contracts and blockchain. And we tend to settle on the fact that things that are simple and repetitive that don't really add a huge amount of value are the things that we would automate. And I think that's a no-brainer when we look at, when we talk about automation through these technologies. There are other things, you know, there are a lot of things though that people would be very uncomfortable with when it comes to automation. And we see that from um, within research is that when you have a contractor that has um, smart contracts that will automate transfer of funds from one party to another, they're very uncomfortable with that because they lose control over that day, over their money. And as soon as you um, take, you know, the ability of them to press, push the button to send the money away from them, they feel very uncomfortable. And that's where you have that resistance to change. So while that's probably very easy to implement, it's a question of whether we actually do go, how far do we implement that? Because we work in an industry, we research an industry that is very, very um, resistant to change and we have to do it gradually bit by bit. So we need to look at just be, um, the different elements of, of systems and processes and applications that can be automated and decide case by case from an application perspective, which should be automated. So we talk about moving into this phase of semi-automation before we move into full automation. And I think that would really help transition from where we are to where we can get to with this technology. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? You have some other questions? Yes. No. Okay. You have Hi, time. I'm back. Yeah. So, yeah, second question. Economical models, you said uh, governance and incentives. Is there anything going on in terms of thinking about uh, things like uh, risk and prospect theories, bounded rationality models, and what is relevant for the individual, and what is the data that belongs to that individual cloud, and uh, what lies outside and, and has no relevance because that will have no impact in your life whatsoever, even though it's something that can be inferred from the data you've created, et cetera, et cetera. Is there a distinction uh, that is being made in respect to governance and incentive and theories of a risk and prospect and bounded rationality models? Did you hear anything about that? Um, so you're going a bit over my head now because that's all quite technical and I'm not a technical person. What I am going to do, because I know that Jens is in the room and he is the one that he's doing a lot of research on economic models and I'm going to so ask I, if he knows how to answer that question. Yeah, I can, give a, I can give like in a nutshell, risk and prospect theory is that when you as an individual make a choice, it's not like a team, a group of people making choices. Is it you? It's, a, it's a, what we call a endogenous decision making, risk and prospect theory, generally speaking. And the other one, bounded rationality models, is basically the decisions you made according to the things you know, because you only know what you know. What you don't know, you cannot use for a decision that you are making. Mm. So it's two big, uh, big uh, areas in economics. Yeah, so I think from what I would add to what I would say to that is that. Um, the idea of, of blockchain is that we don't make decisions individually, so it's collective. Um, so hopefully we build systems that will be based on collective decision making and the code and the smart contracts and, and the system will be set up that would not allow somebody to make um, decisions without approval where necessary. If somebody has the ability to make those decisions individually anyway, then um, and that happens obviously a lot in current business models, then we just need to make an assessment as to whether we want to continue that or whether it needs to be distributed more. Um, that I guess that is probably a very simple response, um, but maybe somebody else in the room has a different response to that. Okay, take a note, that's very, very insightful. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, hello Jennifer. Uh, yeah, thanks for your uh, study and uh, presentation. And uh, you talk about uh, data ownership. So I uh, actually think about 
the concept of the data life cycle. So uh, each data probably has its own life cycle and then uh, about the, the ownership. And so what would you think or in the study have to consider about yeah, uh, in, in what situation then the data should be owned by different people or would the client have the super no, so, uh, the, the, the superposition that uh, it can own all the data, it should be public cloud or private cloud, et cetera. Um, I think the, the issue of data ownership is very interesting. And, and actually, when we talk about construction projects. Um, and particularly across life cycles as well. Okay, um, so. For example, from design to construction to facility management, et cetera. Sure. Um, I mean, obviously, when we talk about data ownership, we talk about intellectual property as well. Um, so if we have designers at the design phase, we have people that um, create designs for buildings and there are, there's intellectual property that they um, have over those designs. But at the same time, we have a client that's paying for those designs. And therefore, if the client is paying for the project, um, do they then automatically, you know, they're paying for the data. So should they own that from the outset? Um, so again, it's not a simple block. It's not a black and white answer for this. It's around. It's making an assessment of where the ownership should lie. Who owns the Who owns the IP? Who is responsible for that data? Who can gain um, gain economically from that data? Um, at different parts throughout the project lifecycle and the ownerships of assets and therefore data within that asset will transfer um, from parties throughout throughout the project throughout the asset lifecycle. Um, and so I think this way, this is where we bring in things like um, the goal and thread of information and thinking about duty holders and who is responsible for managing data at certain points in the life cycle. But who, just because you are responsible for dealing with the data doesn't mean you own the data. Um, so I think we can use blockchain to be very clear about who does own data. But the issue is, is establishing who owns it in the first place, because once you've got that, you know that, then you can put that, you know, you can make that public and be, for whoever needs to know that. Um, where you store it again, it's a, I think it's an application specific issue of where you store that data um, and how it's accessed by different people, whether you store it on chain, off chain, in the cloud or not. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but um, I think the thing is like this isn't particular. I'm not presenting like a specific application. This is that the, the idea of HDI for data and how blockchain can kind of you know what the role of blockchain is in that in that. Okay, thank you. Any other question? So, if one, yeah, one more question. We still have a few minutes more. The, the last one, I promise. Uh, <laughs> so, Jennifer, what happened to Steam, the platform? Do you remember Steam? It was a social media, the social media was called Steam, and it was a social media platform that you get paid to post things if people like it. Um, if they don't remember it, I don't know anything about it, and probably means that it, it wasn't very successful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so I just wonder what happened to the data because people post data there in the blockchain, it was just like Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. And then you would get paid for the things you want to share, and was successful in the platform was got like the more likes you get, the more esteem you would get. I remember, yeah. It was a cryptocurrency, and uh, and then you could use this to do all sorts of things. There were, there were, I think, a moment in time in New York that you could even go to some shops and buy things using Steam coins. Uh, so I just wonder, because that data is still there. And if the platform died, what happened to the data? And we're not interacting with that. So, but you don't, you don't know what happened in the end. No, and I think this is a, I guess, probably adding to the list of open challenges. It's like, what, what do we do with these things? Like, um, how, just because we no longer need it anymore doesn't mean it's not there. If you have that information on a blockchain that is there forever, um, you know, yeah, maybe so this comes into this, um, governance like a ghost, systems. Like a, a social ghost, right? A social data ghost that is there is not going to go away. Yeah. What happens to that? I don't know. Maybe it just stays, sticks there. For, it stays there forever. That's another thing we need to consider as a community, I guess. You don't have to have all the answers to all the questions. <laughs> okay. I definitely don't. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all very much. And let's give uh, Jennifer another round of applause. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we slightly.